Sydney Sweeney was caught lying about where she worked in high school. Why is this happening? And while investigating, I uncovered so many more lies. Like, is anything about Sydney Sweeney real? It all started when she went on Hot Ones to promote Madam Web and was asked, Is it true that you briefly worked as a tour guide at Universal Studios? Yeah, no, um, I... She kind of gave an answer. Um, I always, I love tour guides at Universal. I memorized the entire thing, and so I was there for a little bit. And even though it wasn't the first time she claimed to work there, this response sparked multiple viral TikToks from people who actually work at Universal Studios saying they were certain she was lying. Look, I don't know why Sydney Sweeney is lying about being a Universal tour guide. I have caught Sydney Sweeney in the most obscure lie of all time. It's not true. She's lying. But then on SNL, Sydney doubled down even more. I do want to talk about some stuff I've seen about me online. Like, I once said that I used to work at Universal Studios, and then someone online accused me of lying about that, uh, which is insane. What's weird about this is that this is totally verifiable. Like, they have to have records of who worked there, when, and what they did. So I reached out to some friends with some connections to current Universal employees under the agreement of anonymity, and not only were they able to dig up the records and verify them, they were able to uncover the truth. Okay, so you're saying she was never a tour guide? Not only did they confirm Sydney was not a tour guide, they revealed something else entirely that somehow makes the story even weirder. But before we go down that rabbit hole, we need to figure out how far back the lies go. So when did this all start? Who is Sydney Sweeney actually? Or rather, who does she want us to think she is? Here's the thing about Sydney Sweeney. The more you dig, the more confusing the timeline gets. Years and details don't line up, even in her own interviews. Some are flat out lies, some are manipulations of the truth, but I think it's fair to say that all of them could be described as deceptions. All of it centers around making us see Sydney in a way that might not actually be real. Okay, so here's an example. Sydney always talks about how she lived in Spokane before making it big in Hollywood. It's a grounded, small town beginning. She told the Bristol Herald Courier that unlike her character on Euphoria, she wasn't a cheerleader in high school. Instead, she was on her school's soccer, basketball, ski, and wakeboarding teams. In another interview talking about how different life was in Spokane and the importance of family, the interviewer noted that Sydney was on her school's football, baseball, snow slalom, ski, and robotics teams. She also juggled wakeboarding, golf, softball, skiing, and dirt biking, and was even a member of the academic club called Math is cool. That's a lot. But how did she manage so many activities? You'll find out very quickly, Sydney is very good at absolutely everything. Stop. <laughs> and an acting career, all with an insane commute. My parents drove me from Spokane to Los Angeles just to audition. That's a 19 hour drive. Well, what they don't want you to know is she didn't. Because Sydney Sweeney moved to Los Angeles at 13 to pursue acting. According to the private school itself, Sydney only went to school in Spokane through middle school. Matter of fact, if she didn't go to high school in Spokane, where did she go to high school? Why doesn't she ever mention any schools in LA? I mean, if you literally Google where did Sydney Sweeney go to high school, you just get St. George's in Spokane. But after a good deal of internet sleuthing, I just discovered two LA schools she's linked to, LACS and Brighton Hall, formerly known as the San Fernando Valley Professional School. When I tell you I had to dig, but it was worth it. Not only did I find this throwback photo way down on Brighton Hall's page, but I also stumbled across Kira Kosarin shouting out Sydney and the school in this clip. I went to a, a school for like kids who were professional. It was called Brighton Hall. It used to be called San Fernando Valley Professional School. Yeah. It was like Sydney Sweeney and like yeah. uh, Demi Lovato siblings and Miley Cyrus' siblings. Like it was uh -huh. a lot of like Hollywood kids. Okay. And they posted about her being a graduate of the class of 2016. As you might have guessed by the former name being Professional School, Brighton Hall is not your typical school. Its whole purpose is to help child actors and singers and dancers meet the national education requirements while working crazy hours. It's not a bad school 
school, but school itself isn't really the focus. The kids that go there really just need to check a box. For example, their website advertises classes only run from 8.45 to 1 o'clock, and they pride themselves on flexibility. This makes a lot of sense because auditions and workdays happen during the school week, and Sydney herself estimated she was landing only one role per 100 auditions at the time. And she was booking like three projects a year, so roughly 300 auditions? I mean, Sydney even admitted it in an interview, there was a year when she missed 117 days of school. So we know where she went to school now, even if she's dodgy about it in interviews. I mean, I couldn't find a single place where she mentioned Brighton Hall. Either way, getting back to her crazy long list of extracurriculars, every time this ridiculously long list is mentioned, it's always side by side with the valedictorian fact, implying it's all things she did in high school. But if she did do these as a teen in high school, School, it would have been at Brighton Hall. But ask yourself, would a school catering to working child stars have all those extracurriculars she boasted about? To be fair, she could have played these sports outside of school. There are plenty of clubs, but those cost money. And according to Sydney, as long as we can believe her, money is something her family didn't have a lot of at the time. Things got so bad, Sydney said they had to move into a motel. She and her mom slept on the bed, and her dad and brother shared the couch. That was just normal life for them. So yeah, barely any money to live on, not to mention paying for private school. And Brighton Hall costs up to over $18,000 for Sydney alone, plus acting classes and all those clubs and activities. I think the big deception here is more how the activities are presented. When somebody says that they played a sport, usually you picture them dedicating months and months out of the year and probably competing to some extent. It's not like skiing a few times a year with your family, that's a hobby. And on the school club side, remember math is cool and the robotics club? Well, turns out they were clubs at Sydney's middle school. And remember when she said culture club in a different interview? That's another club that they don't have at Brighton Hall, but they did have at her middle school. I don't know a single person who identifies themselves by the clubs they did in middle school. Like, if you asked me about the sports and the clubs I did throughout my life, I would usually say that I did martial arts because that's what I dedicated years of my life to up through high school, or that I was in theater. But by Sydney's PR rules stretching the timeline of what counts, I guess I'm now somebody that also did tap, ballet, hiking, four-wheeling, grappling, sword, size, photography, jazz, choir, jet skiing, archery, and horseback riding. Okay, so where she went to school, fabricated. Extracurriculars in high school, definitely fabricated. But what about her other school claims? Didn't she say she did all those sports and managed to still be valedictorian? I forgot about this. Yes. I was valedictorian. Well, here's the thing. We now know that all those extracurriculars were in middle school and she was only really auditioning, albeit a lot, in high school. But yes, she was valedictorian. However, Brighton Hall only has about 80 students in the whole school from second grade through 12th grade. So that means she was likely in a senior class of a whopping maybe eight students. So that's not quite as impressive as they're trying to make it sound. To give you an example, based on Brighton Hall's Facebook page, this appears to be the graduating class of 2017, the year after Sydney. Not all of them. Some of them are their moms. It's just these five girls. So right there, you're looking at valedictorian, salutatorian, third place, and the two worst students in the school. So Sydney's getting toward the end of high school. She's auditioning a ton and is keeping her grades up. And then we get to another hazy timeline that threw me for a loop. According to Sydney herself on Kelly Clarkson's show, she took the job at Universal because... I mean, like every high school kid needed a, yeah. a job. Which lines up with the Hot Ones clip we saw earlier and an article in Women's Health too. So this supposed Universal tour guide job happened while she was in high school. And that was the first red flag people caught. The job is not really a high school job. In fact, it's a coveted position at the park and extremely hard to get. I had to do an audition and then a callback and then an interview and then I was invited to train for three weeks before they tested me and then decided if I actually got the job. Not to mention you have to be over 18 to even apply. According to a Redditor, out of the 800 people that showed up to her round of casting, they only hired 25 people at the end of the process. So yeah, people were calling her bluff, which my source confirmed. Universal for about two months. 
interesting. So we have confirmation of her lying, but as this investigation has shown me, there's always a little kernel of truth. We're gonna come back to the job she actually worked, but let's stay focused on this timeline for a sec because it actually exposes two completely different bold-faced lies. Sydney said she worked at Universal as a tour guide in high school. I mean, like every high school kid needed a, yeah. a job. But she only had the job briefly. And then I actually booked um, Sharp Objects. That's a great exit strategy. So Sydney's story is that she worked at Universal for only a short time because she got cast in Sharp Objects. So thanks to our investigation, since she actually did work at Universal for a hot second, we now know that a little bit means two months. But the problem is Sydney graduated high school in 2016. And why does this matter? Well, they didn't even announce casting Sydney in Sharp Objects until May 2017. Bear with me. Now, Hollywood casting announcements can come months after the cast takes place, but I reached out to some sources connected to casting in Hollywood, and I was able to dig up the actual casting breakdown for Sydney's character, Alice, labeled for 2017's pilot season. In case you don't know, pilot season is when the majority of casting for new TV shows used to take place, famously in January. So that means around January 2017, Sharp Objects was looking for someone to play Alice. And since Sydney wasn't announced as the character until May 2017, she likely auditioned in early 2017 and was officially cast around March or April. There's always some time before it hits deadline to work out contracts and scheduling. And remember, we're trying to see if Sydney could have started working at Universal during high school and left after two months because she was cast in Sharp Objects. The problem is, for all of that to be true, Sydney would need to be cast a full six months before pilot season even started. That would be a year before announcing her casting in deadline, which all Already sounds pretty fishy, but I kept digging. And we can confirm that this wasn't some long extended casting process because according to Cody Sullivan, who played Nathan, the casting process was pretty quick. Instead of casting taking months, sharp objects move really fast. Cody even noted, I think they were already filming by the time they had gotten to me. And according to HBO itself, Eliza Scanlon, who played a higher priority role than Sydney Sweeney, wasn't cast until 2017 either. And her deadline announcement came in March, two months before Sydney was announced. So what does this mean? She either is lying about this star is born moment where she's whisked away from working at Universal because she got booked on sharp objects, or she's lying about working at Universal as a high schooler since she would have been out of high school for six months before auditions even started. But either way, she is lying. What we're seeing in all of this is a really inconsistent origin story about who she really is. I mean, is she actually this underprivileged kid who did five sports, at least three clubs, graduated top of her class, acted in a bunch of projects, auditioned constantly, and worked intense real world jobs on top of it? Well, whether it's true or not, that's what Sydney and her PR team want us to believe. But it gets worse. Remember how I said there was a second lie wrapped up in this convoluted little school universal sharp objects timeline? Well, the problem with relying solely on an underdog story is that when you do start to really succeed, you lose lose your underdog status. The only way to maintain the facade is to paint real people, people who existed in her life, as villains in her story, just so she can perpetuate that underdog facade. Take, for example, her college law professor. After high school, Sydney wanted to get her degree in business from UCLA. She was working her butt off juggling sharp objects and Handmaid's Tale, which, yeah, that's a lot. She said she was communicating with her professors and keeping up with her grades, but apparently she didn't communicate well enough because when she flew back from filming in Toronto to take her finals. I walk into my entertainment law class and my professor goes, what are you doing here? I go, what do you mean? I'm here to take my final. He goes, no, you're not. <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? And one villain wasn't enough. The whole class of 900 plus students was against her. And apparently all the kids were upset that I was able to miss so many days of school. Okay, that does sound really harsh, but many people like this Reddit user pointed out a pretty reasonable argument. Plenty of college students have to work one or more jobs and still have to attend their classes if they want to pass or succeed. Either way, just like in her tour guide interviews, Sydney very skillfully wrapped up her chat with Drew 
alluding to the fact that this cruel professor is the reason she is no longer pursuing her business degree. Even ending flippantly, Here, maybe I'll go to law school. She's Elle Woods in this moment. People cruelly trying to deter her, but she is unstoppable. She'll show them despite the fact that this professor single-handedly dashed her dreams of a business degree. One problem. Sydney herself told us the whole finals fiasco happened while filming A Handmaid's Tale, and we know, according to this article, that the 13 episodes in the second season were shot over a period of six months and three weeks, between September 2017 and April 2018. So I decided to find out who this terrible professor was, and after meticulously searching through old UCLA course listings and lining the final up with Sydney's shooting schedule, there is only one entertainment law class with finals possibly during filming. And there was only one professor teaching that semester. I won't out him here since he really does seem like a good professor. I mean, over a hundred students have rated him four out of five stars over the years. But I did see a lot of comments on UCLA's professor feedback page about how for this guy in particular, it was important to come to class. They have a lot of in-class discussion, and it's not uncommon for there to be questions on the final from his lecture that weren't in the reading materials Sydney was using. So when Sydney showed up to take a test worth 40% of her grade without properly preparing, he was probably recommending that she withdraw from the class. I mean, not giving her credit is way better than tanking her GPA with a failing grade. It's certainly not her high school, where she could miss 117 days of school in one year out of 180 that's only two months of actual classes, and still graduate with honors. At UCLA, she was expected to play by the same rules as everyone else. And you might be thinking it's still sad that it stopped her from getting her degree. He didn't let me take the final and I never got credit. But that's where the big old lie comes in. Sydney may have framed it in this interview in 2022 as the reason she couldn't finish her degree. But actually, in 2019, a full year after Handmaid's Tale wrapped, and well after the professor denied her class credit, Sydney told W Magazine she was in the middle of her third year at UCLA. So this means if she was still going to UCLA for two more years after that law professor forbade her from taking the final, then the whole concept the concept of that professor blocking her from her well-earned business degree makes no sense. Sydney was still pursuing her degree fall of 2019. So in all of these lies and exaggerations so far, it's all centered around keeping Sydney relatable to the public instead of one of these Hollywood kids. I mean, why would they want you to think she spent her whole youth and high school in Spokane? Because that makes her sound more like a small town girl. Having way too many extracurriculars while also keeping up her amazing grades? That makes her sound like a one of a kind golden child. And then somehow on top of all of that, working hard jobs at the same time you're doing everything else, one article said she was even cleaning restaurant bathrooms. Well, that makes her sound even more like one of us. Especially coming up from utter poverty to achieve the American dream. I mean, in this convoluted world Sydney and her team have created, of course you're supposed to root for that girl. I know she sounds like Cinderella, but she's actually the equivalent of Batman, a simple human growing up through tragedy yet ascending to become more than human, one of the elite. And not just with hard work, but by overcoming the various villains like the mad professor and his gang of jealous classmates, they are no match for Sydney Sweeney. I mean, even look at her name, it's like a superhero's secret identity. And since she's that spectacle of a human, the best of what we can achieve if we try our hardest, our literal hero, then of course it becomes easy to root for her. Let's get her nominated for some Emmys and show all those other actresses that their time has passed. Oh, and she got engaged to a rich restaurateur and she bought a pricey house in LA, the dream is real. If you work hard, you can have it all. By George, she even bought back her grandparents' farm, the one they'd lost. And of course, this massive display of wealth would normally be hard to stomach, but she's Sydney Sweeney, we're rooting for her. Well, until a birthday post gone wrong, dredged up some good old fashioned internet backlash.
It was the first time Sydney's carefully constructed PR persona was truly put to the test. In August 2022, Sydney posted some cute family photos of her mom's 60th birthday party. The problem? Her fans were not happy to see the hoedown themed birthday party included red hats with Make 60 Great Again printed across them. Then people found photos through party guests' accounts of people sporting the real MAGA hats and even a Blue Lives Matter shirt at the party, which a lot of fans kind of felt betrayed by. And when Sydney tried to respond to the criticism saying, you guys, this is wild, an innocent celebration of my mom's 60th has become an absurd political statement, some people accused her of gaslighting her fans. And I kind of see their point. I mean, red hats with a variation of make anything great again is gonna have a political undertone. You can't just pretend people are being absurd to think that there's a political connection. And it didn't help that in her SNL opening monologue, she continued to dodge the truth. I'm from a town called Spokane, right on the border of Washington and Idaho. When people ask, where are you from? I say Washington. But when people ask, did you go to a Trump themed party for your mom? I say, Idaho. <laughs> and while some fans were upset over the birthday party, others were put off by another article circulating at the time where Sydney said she couldn't afford to take a six month break from acting because actors don't get paid what they used to. And I will say she made some valid points in there, like how LA is expensive and a lot of your salary goes to agents and managers and lawyers and PR teams, etc. But as many people pointed out, LA might be expensive, but you don't have to spend $3 million on a house. There's tons on the market for under 1 million. They just might not be as glamorous as she wanted. Either way, the illusion of the perfect rags to riches American girl loved by all seemed to be fracturing. And it only continued into 2023. Okay, so it's February 2023 and Sydney is starring in the rom-com Anyone But You with Glenn Powell. And she's not just acting. She's also producing the film through her production company with her fiance. That's important. So they start filming and then and suddenly, some photos get leaked showing Sydney and Glenn all over each other in the water. And initially, it was reported as what the two of them are up to when the cameras aren't rolling, but Sydney later clarified that they were in the middle of a scene. So, of course, they were acting flirty. But with that mistaken gossip about them and the fact that her fiance is connected to this project, you know, you'd think they'd be way more careful about being photographed in compromising positions. Except because of the initial photos, the film was now starting to get real attention. So over the next year, social media was flooded with videos of them being flirty. Sydney gazing at Glenn on the red carpet, the two of them posing with each other's families, always sitting next to each other on outings. People were going nuts. The chemistry, the drama, the free publicity for their movie. Of which, remember, Sydney is a producer on. And once again, whether this was a fake or real affair, Sydney and Glenn weren't the ones suffering in the background. Right after this particularly flirty video came out in April, April, Glenn Powell's girlfriend unfollowed Sydney, And then two days later, she released a pretty pointed breakup post, which was confirmed to be true by TMZ the next day. Now, normally I would say that this just sounds like normal rom-com speculation, right? Like it's possible that it's not their fault and people have just blown it out of proportion. I mean, Sydney even lumped it into the part of her SNL monologue about the crazy things the internet has made up about her. But I'd say the craziest rumor I've seen is that while I was feeling filming anyone but you. I was having an affair with my co-star Glenn Powell. But Glenn Powell came out and said that they were told to intentionally play it up. And if you're wondering who was the one that was pushing it on them, well, listen to this quote he gave Cosmo. It certainly doesn't sound like it was his idea. The only reason it was harder for me to lean into that stuff was that I was going through a very real breakup amidst a promotional tour. It was a lot easier for Sydney to lean into something like that because she's in a very committed and wonderful relationship and she's very happy. Which, by the way, you're not crazy if you heard that and thought, how does Sydney having a fiance make it easier for her to pretend that she's sleeping with somebody else? Clearly, if Glenn Powell thinks that, it's because he saw a version of Sydney that had no issues with these rumors. Because as she's done so many times before, she knew what you do for PR and what is actually true don't have to be the same thing. Glenn even specified, I'll pretty much give Sydney all the credit for this. I don't have the mental capacity to pull anything like this off, but she's 
very smart. So there you go. Glenn Powell confirmed that not only was it all just a ruse for PR, but Sydney was the one who decided they should manipulate fans and openly flirt to spark more rumors. Remember, it's her production company. She and her fiance were totally in control. And she was very quick to point that out on SNL while also teasing the PR relationship one more time for good measure. Me and my fiance produced a movie together and he was there the entire shoot. He even came here tonight to support me. Can we uh, cut to him? You. <laughs> Which actually makes it a little more ick when you realize that not only was Glenn uncomfortable with it, but she was making him do it as his boss. Like, she even had him come out on SNL just to do yet another shtick while she talked about how much she loves her fiance and how great he is. After those interviews where he said it was harder for him, Glenn's discomfort is irrelevant to Sydney. It's gross until you remember how little she thinks these lies matter. And what's even crazier is that while verifying Glenn's quotes, I came across a completely different lie from just a few months ago. Turns out Sydney gave Jimmy Fallon a basketball signed by the whole Gonzaga team when she went on his show. You were so cool. I can't believe, how'd you do this? Um. I had some guys slide into my DMs. So basically, Sydney told Jimmy that the way she got the ball signed was that multiple players on the team slid into her DMs because they wanted to hook up with her, and instead, Sydney was able to convince them to get this ball signed for her. Well, surprise, surprise, it turns out that's not quite what happened. Apparently, the truth is that a man named John Craig Jr. was doing renovations on Sydney's mother's house. Sydney's mom had the idea to get Jimmy a signed ball, so she had this contractor. John call his friend to pull some strings with the basketball team and this nice man rushed to get the ball signed for her before Sydney left for New York. Like they got it to her at 10 p.m. at night. So it had nothing to do with DMs. Not only that, but the Gonzaga basketball team even backed up John's post where he outed the true story with photos and all. Like Sydney, girl, why do you need to lie about that? It's so much more interesting and charming that this much effort went into making it happen and also, once again, this guy probably felt really good about himself and what he'd achieved for you. And rather than lift him up, you erased him and you made the Gonzaga guys seem creepy, all to make yourself look like what? I'm gonna be honest, I'm really not sure how the DM story is better than this adorable group effort. And if you think that was an unnecessary lie, how about the water controversy that just got stirred up with her by water partnership? Instead of saying she mostly drinks water or that she prefers water, Sydney went all in. The only drink I drink is water. I only drink water. According to Sydney, that means no juice, tea, coffee, or soda. Except, by water contains juice, tea extract, coffee extract, and a bunch of additives. Like, tell me this drink Sydney partnered on looks that color because of the 1% of juice they put in it. And sure, maybe you're thinking she could just be a terrible spokesperson who doesn't drink the product she's pushing, but then I remembered this 2022 article I read where Sydney herself says she likes to celebrate by drinking Shirley Temples. You know, the mocktail that's entirely made of soda and grenadine. So yeah, sure, maybe she drinks water a lot, good for her, but why say you haven't drank anything else since the age of 12? This is getting ridiculous. There are so many more things we could get into, like the speculation around the whole Sweeney family poverty story and how weird it sounds when you realize that her mom was a lawyer and then right after her parents filed for bankruptcy, they still sent her brother to a $20,000 a year school in Spokane, the same one that Sydney went to for up through middle school. I guess the poverty story is a good way to set up her story about having to work those high school jobs to help pay her family's bills. Of course, it doesn't matter that that only three months later, while on Hot Ones, she said it wasn't her family's bills, it was her own bills. And I had to pay all my own bills. Pay my own phone bill, car insurance, uh, everything, gas. The typical time for you to learn budgeting bills, like your cell phone, your gas, that kind of thing. Not quite the same thing as covering her family's real bills. There's also the conflicting interviews about letting her family watch her movies or TV shows. In January 2022, she said, I get way too nervous to watch any of my own work with my family, even the work with no nudity. But 
Only two months later, she said this about Euphoria. So for the premiere, I invited my entire family. So your entire were, family meaning who? Like my grandparents, my uncle. You invited my, your grandparents. Oh yeah, I, I was like, it's a Hollywood premiere, like you gotta come. Similarly in GQ UK, she said her dad has never seen Euphoria, but then in many other interviews, Sydney tells the story of how her dad started to watch Euphoria with his parents and had to turn it off because of the nudity. Which makes sense, by the way, because this is the show that has the record for most visible penises in one shot. And yet it's also the same show that she invited these grandparents to see at the premiere. So which is it? Are you too embarrassed or are you gung-ho to have them watch it? And of course there's the recent article claiming Sweeney hasn't moved to Los Angeles like a lot of other actors have. Which Sydney explains with, I just live out of a suitcase but I still consider Spokane home base. It's not like she's owned not one but two houses in LA and Euphoria shoots in LA for most of the year. But let's get back to the root of all this chaos, the Universal Studios lie. Yeah, uh, so with me, with what we call an entertainment assistant or uh, a character escort, basically they're like the person that just helps the, the characters get into their big costumes and walk around the park make sure they're okay. Okay, so like, I don't get it. Why wouldn't she just say that she did that? I'm not sure. I don't know. I think it would be like it is kind of a big deal to be a porn actor. Yeah, so I mean, I guess it's a little bit more glamorous than the like putting a minion's shoes on or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, I have my assumption is that she probably would not like she has a harder job. Um, because it's kind of a little bit of a stress getting into the costume. So it's like, how many people do you Okay, so for Sydney, it wasn't just about looking like the average American teenager working to pay their phone bill. It's also about being the best. It's a coveted position held by people in their 20s and 30s and even older. But she, as a high schooler, was good enough to do it. So, is Sydney Sweeney lying about everything? Well, there are definitely some bold-faced lies, but it's hard to say how many because, like I said before, she always uses a kernel of truth. But the real question is why is she lying? Well, let me give you two scenarios. In one, a bright-eyed young actress moves to LA all by herself. She works crazy hours at coffee shops and restaurants while auditioning and taking any roles she can get. She barely has money to eat some days. She crashes on couches. She is seriously struggling. But then, after a decade of poverty and hard work, she gets her big break, the big audition, and she books it. In the other scenario, a firmly middle-class kid tells their family they want to be an actor after one small role in a movie, so her parents pack up everything and move to LA. She gets to audition for a ton of projects and build her resume while she's young, going to private schools alongside other child actors and networking with their successful parents. And because, unlike 99% of actresses who move to LA, her parents came with her and are still supporting her, she doesn't really have to work other jobs. She doesn't pay rent or electrical bills or for her own groceries. And then, Finally, after about six years of living in LA and booking all kinds of small roles first, she finally gets cast in three different TV shows. And listen, that second one doesn't sound easy. There's still a lot of work and sacrifice, but it certainly doesn't sound as inspirational as the first one. We aren't really rooting for the second person, the one based on Sydney's actual life. Being the underdog comes with so much more protection. Like if for some reason someday people told you that that first actress was mean to a barista, you'd think she's probably probably just having a bad day. She knows how hard it is to do that kind of work. But the other one, the one who is still putting in a lot of effort, but didn't live like a normal person, if you heard that she was mean to a janitor, you'd probably think she was an entitled Hollywood brat. By the way, that first option is a lot of real people. Margot Robbie got her start in soap operas, but scraped together money for food and rent in LA for years. Kihui Kwan brought people to tears when he won his Oscar, because his life was damn hard. Mom, I just want an Oscar. And he worked through decades of rejection, just begging for a chance to be taken seriously. And then just as he was about to give up, he was offered the role of a lifetime. It's the American dream. And that's exactly what Sydney wants you to see her as. Valedictorian, sports, even football, entrepreneurship, literally buying back the family farm. She even started fixing up vintage cars. She learned MMA. She started listing every sport and club she did in middle school and bragging about working jobs 
job she didn't even have in high school, so she looked like the kid that was so impossibly busy, there's no way she was just an LA wannabe actress like the girls around her. This Sydney, Lake Sydney, as they even tried to brand her in Women's Health this fall, is a farm girl who loves to get muddy, spends all her time on the water, and is wildly intelligent, loving math, the robotics team, and acing all of her classes. And look, even if we do give the benefit of the doubt that her or her team aren't intentionally lying, that there was just a miscommunication between giving tours and escorting characters, why wouldn't she correct them? Instead, she works so hard to evade answering the question in every interview. Is it true that you briefly worked as a tour guide at Universal Studios? Yeah, no, um, um, I always, I love tour guides at Universal. We have something else in common. I love theme parks and you worked at Universal, did you not? I mean, like every high school kid needed a, yeah. a job. Yeah. And I was taking anything that I could get. Yeah. Do you remember the speech from the tram? I'm not reciting the speech. <laughs> Remember, when she was on SNL and she brought all of this up, she totally had an opportunity to just easily set the record straight. And yet, instead, she evaded all of it once again. I once said that I used to work at Universal Studios, and then someone online accused me of lying about that. Uh, which is insane. And I mean, with all the people calling Sydney out for these snowballing lies and comparing her to Jennifer Lawrence's cool girl phase, something needs to change. I mean, Jennifer Lawrence is a cautionary tale in and of herself. When people started to feel like her ultimate down-to-earth cool girl persona was a little too manufactured and inauthentic, she quickly dropped from Hollywood's new favorite it girl, who was constantly in new movies, to the subject of 2023 articles saying she wants to win us back. If Sydney wants to get out of this spiral of ever-growing lies and back into fans' good graces, it might be a good idea to start leaning into more of that radical honesty people are craving from celebrities. It's relatable, it's sincere, and Sydney, honestly, girl, you gotta get a handle on all this before even you lose track of what's real. So what do you guys think? I mean, at least she's not openly ruining lives like Ariana is, and if you don't know about that whole mess, make sure to check out the video I just made about it. In the meantime, I've been Abby Reed, and remember, honesty is the best policy.